Maybe uh, it would be fun to talk about a, um, this is a fun fact. I don't know how many of you are, are aware of this. The arc length is all about measuring the length of a curve. You know, if I give you a function like this, um, the arc length is about the actual length of the curvy bit along the curve. All right, that's the arc length. And there's a formula for that that we're gonna we're gonna get into eventually, but um, I thought maybe before we get into that the the details, I would mention uh, a little sort of fun fact. This is something that actually I was not aware of when I was a student. I first learned about this maybe ten years ago or so. Um, <coughs> that this is about just measuring curvy things in the real world. Measuring curvy things. in the real world, in real life, is actually very hard. This is something I mentioned last time. Like there are some sort of special, special instruments for doing this in real life, um, like a, sort of a wheel at the end of a stick you can push around and measure a thing which is curving. Or, or even there's some, there's some kinds of like flexible rulers or something like that. But I'm talking about, um, Things which are very curvy, like large things, like the coastline of the state of Connecticut or something like that. I don't know if you've ever thought about um, something like, how long is the coastline of the state of Connecticut? Or uh, questions uh, like that. Such questions turn out to be very, very hard to answer and are in some senses um, oftentimes just straight up unanswerable. Um, I'm thinking of something like, for example, if I have, let's say, like the Mississippi River, I can draw my, this is my picture of the United States. That's Texas and Florida at the bottom. And then the Mississippi River, you know, is, is like something like that, right? Um, how would you, if I asked you to measure me the length of the Mississippi River, let's just assume that there's, the Mississippi River consists of only like one thing, which I know is not reality. Um, the standard way to do this, even like an enlightened calculus student, their basic idea would be to somehow like choose a bunch of points along the distance, take straight line measurements from point to point, and then add that up. And you would say, this is not the true distance. Like those four straight line distances are not the true distance of the wiggly thing, but they're kind of close. That's the, that's the basic idea, which is basically behind all of calculus is by dividing things up into straight <coughs> things, whether they be straight lines or like rectangles in the case of area under the curve. And then you add up the, the little bits. Can anybody say actually in this particular example, if you add the straight segments, is that, so it's not exactly equal to the length of the curvy thing. Is that an underestimate uh, or a, an upper, an overestimation? Or maybe you, maybe you can't tell, yeah? Overestimation? The, the straight ones is an overestimation of the curved? Is that what I mean? <laughs> it looks like. Are the straight ones longer or the curved part longer? I think maybe, I, so when I drew them, they're not really perfectly straight, but. Anyone have it? Yeah, I was going to say it's an under, the straight is an underestimation. Yeah, I think actually the straight one must be an underestimate. Why do you say that? I don't know. It's just like, just like looking at it, I feel like the curved lines look longer. Yeah, like I, if I look, say, at the, the, the bottom one there, certainly in that case, the straight one is shorter than the curved one. Is that always going to be true? I think it is always true that uh, this is something I think everybody knows. The straight line will always be a shorter, you know, the shortest distance between two points is always the straight line. So if you have a choice between the straight one versus the curvy one, the straight one is always shorter than the curvy one. All right. So this sort of red estimation, um, the uh, the straight lines always give an underestimation. All right. underestimate because the straight lines are straight but the curvy line is um, even the parts which look straight at this scale of the United States of course being very big like even this one right here it looks straight the uh, the original like the black line which you can't even see here looks fairly straight but you know in real life it's not actually straight and if you were to zoom in if this were, were a real map and you would zoom in on the picture 
you would see what looks curvy here is actually in reality more curvy than it seems on this picture, right? Um, and this is, this is a sort of a, you have to, I don't know if, you, I had to think about this for a while the first time someone brought this to my attention, but it is a fact. If you were to zoom in, if this were a real map and you zoomed in on the Mississippi River, as you zoom in, it would get more curvier and never less curvier, right? A, a line which appears to be curved, when you zoom into it, you will see more wiggles as you zoom in on the river, but you cannot ever see less wiggles. Is this making sense? Do you agree with me when I say this? This is something I had to think a little bit about, but it, it's not possible that, say, a line on some larger scale seems to be curvy, but then you zoom in and you realize actually it was straight, it was straight that whole time. That's not possible. But the opposite is possible. If it looks, if it looks straight on one scale, it is possible that you zoom in on it and you realize that it was actually curvy when you thought it was straight. But the other way is not possible. All right. So <coughs> what I'm trying to say here is the straight lines always give an underestimate. And as we zoom in, the true line, I mean the true like curvy thing, the true shape may be curvier than we thought, but it's never less curvy than we thought. That's what I'm saying. There's, there's a weird sort of asymmetry here. The true shape may be curvier than we thought. <coughs> and I think on some, on some level, everybody knows this, like this blackboard, which seems to be perfectly flat. If you look at it under like an electron microscope or something, you realize that it's, it's actually not flat um, at that scale. It's not possible, though, to see a rough thing and then look at it in a microscope and realize it was actually perfectly straight. That, that's not possible. Then if it was perfectly straight, it would have looked straight to begin with. All right, so as we zoom in, the true shape may be curvier than we thought. What that means is, as we zoom in, the actual length always ends up being more than we thought. Because this is like true of things in real life. As you zoom into them, they actually are more curvy and more jaggedy than they seem. This is basically true of everything in reality. All right, this is not true of like abstract mathematical shapes. Of course, a straight line is perfectly straight because it's not a real object. But a real object in real life, um, is always more wiggly or more curvy than we thought. And what that means is the actual length always ends up being more than you thought it was when you tried to zoom in on things, all right? And I, I would like to bring something to your opinion, so, or to your attention. This is called, this is called the coastline paradox. Anybody heard of this before? This is a cute, cute thing to share with your friends, maybe. Read the room before talking about the coastline paradox among friends, but uh, it is something that I think anybody would be interested in if given the proper uh, vibes to the conversation. It's an interesting thing, all right? When you take a curvy thing in real life, not an abstract mathematical shape, but like an actual thing in, in real life, it always ends up being more curvy and more wiggly than you thought. And what that means is as you continue to zoom in on something, its length always ends up being more than you thought it was. This is referred to as the coastline paradox. This was first kind of realized when people tried to answer questions like, for instance, how long is the coastline of the state of Connecticut? You know, the state of Connecticut looks something like this. And I drew that as super wiggly. Um, is the real state of Connecticut this wiggly or even wigglier? The answer is even wigglier. Because when you zoom in, it, I mean, it, it's not ever that straight, right? It's always wigglier than you thought it was. And so if you, as a, you know, the typical strategy for a good calculus student would be, first I sort of measure with straight segments. And if that's not accurate enough, I just use smaller and smaller straight segments and I should get more and more accurate results. But the fact is, when you use smaller and smaller straight segments, the length you're measuring actually gets bigger at the same time. And so very weird things happen. I have a cute little thing here. If you check out, if you're interested, check out the, um, 
There's a nice Wikipedia article about the coastline paradox, which is where I got this picture from. Come on now. There it is. So what you see here, this is actually an animated picture in, in its original form, but I, I guess you, my, my notes app here can't handle animated GIFs. But anyway, um, what you see here is uh, Great Britain. This is, for some reason, like the people who first studied this were, were always talking about the coastline of Great Britain. So anyway, if you measure the coastline of Great Britain with line segments that are sort of big like this, you get a certain answer. And the question uh, that you should, I mean, the natural approach to a calculus, uh, from a calculus mindset would be just use increasingly smaller segments and keep on measuring it with smaller and smaller segments. And then somehow, like, in the limit, this should equal the true length of the coastline. Over here, what you see is um, these are the answers that you get by using various sized segments. So if my segment is really big, which is what the picture over here is representing, then the, the length that you're measuring ends up being fairly small. But as you shrink the size of the segment, so if my segment, this says in, in the scale of kilometers, if you take your segment to be 10 kilometers long and you add them all up, this is the length that you get. If you take your segment to be one kilometer long and add them all up, this is the length that you get. What you see here is as I continue to shrink down the size of like, you can imagine doing this with like a measuring stick or something. As you use shorter and shorter measuring sticks, the lengths that you get do not gradually converge to the true length. The lengths that you get just increase forever. All right, there is no point at which you settle down and you sort of converge onto the actual value of the length. The, as you shrink the, the yardstick you're using, the lengths that you measure just keeps on <coughs> getting longer forever. Anyone say, hear what I'm saying here? Anyway, the, the, uh, the conclusion is, if you wanna, if you wanna tell your friends just the punchline, there is no such thing as the length of the coastline of Connecticut or anything like that. There is no such thing. The only way this could make sense is if you imagine measuring it with increasingly small uh, sticks or whatever. But actually, if you really do that in real life, you will not uh, converge on any particular length. The figures that you get will just go up to infinity. Uh, this is deeply strange, in my opinion. Anyone have any thoughts about this? So you could ask, for example, which state has more coast, uh, Connecticut or Florida? And the answer is they're kind of the same. That, like, there is no, there is no such thing. Uh, or you could say, if you really wanted to do it, you could say, well, if I were to measure using straight segments of length uh, one mile, say, then you could give me the answer of each of those. But that's just one uh, particular choice of how you could measure it. That, that is not actually representative of a, any kind of true mathematical reality of the situation. Strange but true. I found this also at, at the same page, if you're into this. This is the last thing I'll say about this. <laughs> There's a Wikipedia article called List of Countries by Length of Coastline. This sounds like a totally ordinary thing. Shouldn't there, it be possible to make a list of all the countries and arrange them, sort them according to how much coast each of them has? I happen to know like Uzbekistan has zero coastline. Actually, the coastline of Uzbekistan does exist and it is zero. But basically everything else, um, and check out the way that you see the rankings here. Canada is ranked number one. There's two different sources that have been used to measure these coastlines, and they measured them using two different methodologies, and you can see their answers are wildly different. Here, Canada is 202,000 versus 265, which is a pretty big difference. Some of them are even more dramatic, though. Norway comes in second place by this source, but it's seventh place according to this source. And Norway's coastline is 83,000 kilometers. Um, according to this source, Russia's coastline is 110,000, but only 37, according to this source. These, uh, there is no consistency or agreement between these two columns. And that's because the thing that they're trying to measure as an abstract mathematical concept doesn't exist at all. 
These are only two different ways of measuring can give you specific answers. But this is not actually, they are not measuring a true mathematical reality. Eh? Very strange. So does Russia or Norway have a longer coastline? The answer is, if you measure it in this way, Russia seems to have a much longer coastline. But if you measure it in this way, then Norway seems to have a much longer coastline. And who is right? The answer is, neither of them are right, because they're not actually measuring anything real in the first place. All right? Any thoughts about that? It's very strange, in my opinion. Yeah. This is like, you know, it's like they say, uh, race is a social construct. Like, there's not a scientific way to measure, like, how white somebody is. Although I'd be pretty close to the top of the scale, I think. But um, something like that is also true of this, right? Which seems weird to me. Like, on some intuitive level, I feel like there kind of is such a thing as the coastline of Canada. But actually, as a mathematical thing, this is not something which can be measured scientifically. Or at least you, there are certain measurements you can do, but those are not perfect measurements. They're just individual ways of measuring. Like you can measure how dark my skin is according to the light or whatever, but that doesn't actually encapsulate the reality of, of what I'm trying to talk about if I'm talking about race. And it's, it's similar here. There are ways to measure it, but they're just individual uh, choices that you make. Right? Strange but true. Any, any thoughts about that? The coastline paradox is, a, is an interesting and weird thing. All right, great. Uh, this also comes up, like I, uh, I go hiking sometimes and I have an app in my phone which, um, which is like a GPS app which measures how, um, how, how far I went, right? Or like if you like running, there's running apps that do that. Uh, it, is, it is a fact, they are basically just making it up because there actually is no such thing as the distance of the whatever curvy track that I walked along is not a thing which can be measured precisely. Um, strange but true. All right. All right. Great. Uh, anyway, let's talk about the arc length. So this is all a, a big preamble to say that what we're talking about when we talk about mathematical arc length is an abstraction. And the mathematical arc lengths do <coughs> exist. Um, so there is such a thing as the length of a curvy line, as long as that curvy line is a, a like mathematically ideal abstract thing, not a real thing uh, that you might encounter in real life. Uh, so let's get down to some details about um, mathematical arc length. Mathematical arc length. <coughs> So you can actually do this strategy where you measure a curved thing by uh, individual straight distances. And that actually does work if you're talking about abstract mathematical concepts. So if I have a curve, a nice mathematical curve, which is given by an equation, the strategy for measuring the arc length, let's say I want to measure from A to B. We are going to do the typical strategy from calculus, which is to divide the domain up into a bunch of little bits. And this should be more accurate the, the littler the bits are. So maybe I'll divide it up like this. And then within each bit, we consider these straight segments. And we're going to try to add up all of those straight segments. And then take the limit as the size of the subdivisions goes to 0. And that will hopefully be something which, uh, which makes sense. So I'm going to call these little widths here delta x. The next one is also delta x. I'm thinking of this kind of like the setup for a Riemann sum, only I'm not adding up the areas under the curves. I'm adding up the lengths of those diagonal lines uh, each time. All right. And maybe we can say precisely what those diagonal sort of segment lengths are. Each segment. Each segment length. If I just consider maybe just one of these little bits, let's say the curve does that, the straight segment does that, where this point, I'm going to call this like xi, and maybe this is xi plus 1, the next one, right? I'm, you know, when you write like Riemann sums, we're not going to go too, uh, too crazy about this, but you usually write, you know, x1, x2, x3, x4. Etc. So let's say I'm at one of those points and I go over to the right. Of course, this is equal to 
x i plus delta x, right? If the if the width here is delta x. And how could we say specifically what the length of that straight segment is? You can use some kind of a Pythagorean theorem kind of deal here. Can anyone say what's the length across the bottom of that triangle? Delta. It is delta x. Yeah, that's kind of already on the picture there. So this is delta x. And the height here, well, the height is not so simple to say, but it's the height at the top minus the height at the bottom. And the heights of each of those would be given by plugging into the function, like the y values of the curve at the top and at the bottom. And the y value at the bottom, this y value here is f of xi, right? And then the y value at the top would be f of xi plus 1, which is the same as f of xi plus delta x, right? So actually this is, this is a little complicated, but that's the height of that segment. <laughs> f of xi plus delta x, that would be the, the, uh, the height all the way up to the top, but then I subtract this, uh, which is the smaller height there. f of xi plus delta x minus f of xi. All right, and then finally, what is the length of the hypotenuse side? You do the Pythagorean theorem kind of a thing. So this hypotenuse length is square root of <coughs> delta x squared plus that other thing f of xi plus delta x minus f of xi squared, like that. All right, sorry if that's hard to read. It says f of xi, I'm going to write this again. I wasn't pleased with my handwriting. f of xi plus delta x minus f of xi. OK. Squared. Right? That is the length of the hypotenuse section. Okay? And the total length then, as measured by these segments, would be the sum of all of those things. So the total arc length, I would add up all of those little bitty bits. The total arc length, I will say, is approximately equal to the sum of all of those things. The sum of the various xi's, where I go each time I'm adding delta x squared plus this other stuff. f of xi plus delta x minus f of xi. All right? Squared, like that. That's an approximation of the total arc length. If you want the actual arc length, you would somehow take a limit as delta x goes to 0 um, to turn this into the actual arc length. And I want to do that, but I'm going to do something just to simplify a little bit. This is, uh, it's not clear why you would want to do this, but it turns out to work out great. I'm going to, under the square root, factor out a delta x squared. And when it comes out of the square root, it just becomes straight up delta x. So I'm going to factor delta x squared out of the square root sign. It will become delta x. And then what remains on the inside is now 1 because I factored that out. And then this other thing is now going to have to be divided by delta x squared. I'm going to put it inside of the squaring that's already there. Like so. All right. I divided out delta x squared from inside the square root sign. That turns this delta x squared into a 1, and it turns this into that divided by delta x inside of the square. All right. So this is, um, this is an approximation of the total arc length. And the true arc length comes from taking uh, the limit as delta x goes to 0. So I will write it out. Lim delta x goes to 0 of this sum. And then I'm going to write it just for reasons. I'm going to write the delta x at the end here, writing it the other way around, just rearranging the order in there. All right. And lucky for us, this is a Riemann sum because 
It is a limit as delta x goes to zero of a thing times delta x. That means when you do this limit, it turns into an integral. So this part, sort of this limit of the sum becomes an integral. Delta x becomes a dx. This is what happens when you take the limit of a Riemann sum. It creates an integral with respect to x. And then I'm going to write the inside of this square root, but with x instead of xi. The only thing is we have to worry about this delta x. What happens to the delta x in here when I take this limit as delta x goes to 0? So it is going to have you know square root 1 plus. That stuff is not very interesting. But what happens to that part? Can anybody say? Does it look familiar? It's the definition of the derivative. It is the definition of the derivative, he said. I agree. Most people, uh, you know, often the, the definition of derivative is written with an h here instead of delta x. But it's the same thing. It's just being called. Uh, the name of the variable is delta x rather than h. But it's still a thing becoming 0. And this fraction is exactly what the definition of the derivative is supposed to look like. So that part becomes f, I didn't mean to write it in red, f prime of x squared, like that. And this is the formula for the arc length. All right, it comes from just, you know, measuring the hypotenuse with the Pythagorean theorem and then doing some weird simplifying. All right, so I'm going to write this again sort of in a box. Uh, the arc length of the graph of f of x from, let's say, x equal a to x equal b is, sometimes they write it with an L, I don't care. 1 plus f prime of x squared inside of a square root sign. All right, so this is the arc length formula. All that was a bunch of talk, although the formula ends up being fairly easy to work with. I mean, there, it's not a very complicated formula to remember. This is the arc length along a curve, an abstract mathematical curve, All right? If you're trying to measure actual curve distances in real life, I would say basically you're screwed. Although if the thing you're trying to measure looks like sine or cosine, then you can use this formula. But um, if it's a real wiggly thing, not happening. All right, this is the arc length formula. And for the remainder of our time together today, I want to just try some examples. <coughs> Actually, maybe maybe we'll do a few examples and then move on to something else. But there's you know there's not a lot to it. It's just a, an integral. So if I ask you to find the arc length of whatever. You just kind of plug everything in here and try to do the integral. There's, there's no like special tricks that you need. Um, although you will see these integrals often <coughs> end up being pretty hard to do. But let's just try some. So how about this one? Let's find the uh, arc length of f of x equals x to the 3 halves power from 0 to 1. So if you were to draw a graph of this, the 3 halves power is, is like the square root of x cubed. So it, the graph of it looks kind of like the square root of x, which is that. All right. So this is what the graph looks like. Just in terms of some sort of like uh, I don't know what I was going to say. That's what the graph looks like. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's just see if we can do it. I'm going to plug everything into the, the formula up here. So in order to plug into the box, we need to know what f prime of x is. So we can do that. Uh, in this case, f prime of x is 3 halves x to the 1 half, right? And now I should be able to just plug everything into, into the box. So it says integral 0 to 1, square root. 1 plus 3 halves x to the 1 half squared. All right. Make sure you don't forget all the various pieces of the formula. It is the derivative squared. So here's my derivative, and then you've got to square it. All right. And now, uh, simplify as much as you can here. Any, any ideas? What, what can we simplify there?
Yeah. X to the one half in the squared. Yeah, x to the one half is inside of the squared, and so what does it turn into? Well, I don't know what the three halves squared is right off the top of my head, but right. it would just be x. Yeah, right. So I would say here I have two things multiplied together. I'm going to square each of them. When you do x to the half squared, it just is x. Three halves squared, I guess, is nine fourths. You know, three halves times three halves. I, I don't need to simplify any more than that. So I'm going to say this is one plus nine fourths x, just x, right? x to the one half to the squared is just x dx. OK, great. Uh, I don't think this can simplify anymore. How would you do the integral? Now is when you start thinking of your various tricks. What's the appropriate thing to do here? Yeah? U sub? Yeah, this is just an ordinary u substitution. What do you want the u to be? 1 plus 9 fourths x. Right. Yeah, just the inside of the square root sign is the u. And that means du is just, uh, just 9 fourths, right? 9 fourths dx. And so if I move the constant around, as I usually do, that will be 4 ninths du is dx, right? So when I plug in here, it becomes integral square root of u and then times 4 ninths du. You can change the boundary values if you want to. Well, I'm going to put the x back in at the end. That's how I usually prefer to do it. All right. Uh, u Square root of u, of course, is u to the 1 half, right? This is the same as integral u to the 1 half. I'll pull the 4 ninths out. And then when we do the integral, we increase the 1 half becomes a 3 halves. And then you divide by 3 halves, also known as multiplying by 2 thirds. So this becomes 4 ninths, 4 ninths times 2 thirds u to the two, uh, 3 halves, right? <laughs> And I have to plug in my x values, x equals 0, x equals 1. Don't plug those in for you. You have to put the x's back first and then plug in for, for the x's. Right, OK, let's, let's just do it. Um, this becomes, I suppose if you combine those fractions, it's 8 over 27. And then put the x's back in, it's 1 plus uh, 9 fourths x to the power 3 halves. And I'm plugging in 1 and 0. So I get 8 over 27 times 1 plus 9 fourths to the 3 halves minus 8 over 27 times 1 plus 0 to the 3 halves. That's my final answer. Very strange uh, number that is. I decided just for fun to plug this into my calculator. 1.439 is what I got. Does that seem about right? My answer is, I don't know. I mean, the picture here, um, 1.4, the picture here, I would say like <coughs> this diagonal line is distance root two. So this, whatever the curve line should be slightly more than root two, which I think this is. Anyone know the digits of root two? I don't. They better be less than that, because that's what I'm saying. All right, any, uh, any questions about that one? Unfortunately, that was kind of an easy one. It, it just, because of the way this formula in the box is, if you start with a normal looking function for f, after you take its derivative and then square it, you often get very weird looking things under the square root sign, unfortunately. Uh, so often you have to do weird tricks to finish the integral off. All right, let's try one more. Sorry, I got two more. Not to get your hopes up. Let's try. When you do the homework problems on this, you will see some of them look pretty crazy. And it's, it's because you have to make weird functions in order for the integral to, to work out nicely. So let's find the uh, arc length of, here's a weird function, ln of sine x. And let's do it from x equals pi over 4 to x equals pi over 2. How about that? ln of sine x. All right, that's a weird function, but you know, no, no, no need for introspection, really. Let's just start working it out. So you need f prime of x because that's what you're going to plug into the formula for the arc length. It involves f prime of x squared. Uh, can someone say what's the derivative of that? Uh, 
said something. Negative cotangent? Give me give me something. Just one over sine and then times tangent. Or just times. Yeah, cotangent. so. Yeah, this is what I would have said. One over sine x times cosine x, right? Uh, that's the derivative of the ln gives you like a one over whatever. And then you do the chain really have to multiply times the derivative of the inside. Okay, and that, yeah, that is cotangent of x. Okay, so I guess this is what goes inside the arc length thing. So that means my arc length is integral uh, pi over four to pi over two, and then square root one plus cotan squared of x dx. All right, uh, can we do anything to simplify that? The answer is yes. This is a, a little known. Anyone know the, the little known trig identity, which I'm going to use here? One plus cotangent squared is? Cosecant it is squared. cosecant squared. Yeah, th so this is an obscure thing, which I would not really expect you to remember on a test. But on the homeworks, I will expect you to kind of try and look this stuff up. But yeah, this, this is a, a general fact. One plus cotan squared of x is cosecant squared of x. All right, dx. Okay, and now we can do the square root of cosecant squared is just straight up cosecant. So this is pi over four to pi over two of cosecant x dx. And that, there is an antiderivative formula. And again, this is something that I wouldn't necessarily expect you to have memorized this formula, but uh, the integral of cosecant is minus cosecant x cotan x. And I'm going to plug in these values. All right. She don't like the integral of cosecant. No. Thank you. She told me she had to go somewhere. All right. So provided that you can remember this random batch of stuff, uh, it's not so hard to uh, do this. Uh, these are not hard steps. They're just you have to happen to know those formulas. Okay, and then let's let's try and uh, actually get this answer. Plug the values in. So this says minus cosecant. Um, can I, you know, when I, I don't know about you, when I try to plug in values of cosecant and cotangent, I find it easier to just write it all in terms of sines and cosines. So cotangent is cosine over sine, and cosecant is one over sine, so that means I have two sines in the denominator and a cosine. So this is really, I find this easier to write it this way cosine x over sine squared x, pi over 2 and pi over 4, right? And now, just because I like plugging into sines and cosines rather than those other things, so this is minus cosine pi over 2 divided by sine squared pi over 2 minus another minus, so it's a plus, cosine pi over 4 divided by sine squared pi over 4. Right. And then what are those values? Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So the first fraction is 0. And then cosine of pi over 4 is 1 over root 2. And sine of pi over 4 is also 1 over root 2, or root 2 over 2 if you prefer. Anyway, this is 1 over root 2 divided by 1 over root 2 squared, which I think ends up just equaling root 2 if you do all the fractions, fraction on fraction. <laughs> is that right or is it? I think that is right. Yes. 2 over root 2, which is the same as root 2. I yeah. could be wrong, but didn't you, did you not think the derivative of cosecant by accident? Is that the derivative? Yeah. Because it's 1 over sine, you can be like quotient rule, and that's what you get. That may be, actually. What is the integral of cosecant? I think, you, yeah, I think you might be right. I made this example up myself this morning, and I was uh, perhaps not thinking clearly at the time. Yeah, I think the integral of cosecant is some weird thing involving a natural log of something or other, now that you mention it. I, sorry, if I had my book, I would open to the back cover of my book, which has formulas for all of these things. Oh, you got a list. What is the integral of cosecant? Um, it's negative natural log of the absolute value of cosecant x plus cotangent x. Oh, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> All right. Thank yeah. There, 
this is a very good uh, observation then. Okay, so can we can we just make this right by scribbling this? It, yeah, he, he's he's totally right. That was the derivative of cosecant. I was I was proud of myself this morning that I remembered the derivative of cosecant. No, I was proud that I remembered the integral, which I did not. I, I thought it was the integral. Okay, um, I, I don't think I want to finish the whole thing, but can you can you just say that again? What you just said? Yeah, um, negative. Uh, sorry, I'm stuck on the. Okay, so this. So I'm very sorry about this. This right here is not an integral anymore, right? Negative ln. Absolute value. Yeah. Cosecant x plus cotangent x. Both inside there. Yes. All right. I believe her. I believe women. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sorry about that. And can I just say, et cetera, you plug those values in and you get some, some strange answers. <sighs> sorry about that. <coughs> All right. Excellent. The moral of the story is you get these arc length things end up giving you very weird answers, even when the functions you start with are, are fairly um, ordinary. And this function that I started with was specifically um, chosen to make this work out nicely, at least up to here. But then you have to remember the um, strange integration formula for cosecant. All right, great, thanks. Okay, I have one more, which is equally unsatisfying, although I, I think at least I didn't do it wrong. Um, and this is what you will encounter. You may encounter some like this on the homework. This is one last arc length thing. And then we'll move on to something completely different. Find the arc length. This is like a, this is a deceptively simple looking example, but this is just the arc length along the standard parabola, y equals x squared right there, right? From zero to one. As you will see, it turns out the answer is totally crazy. I don't know what you expect the answer to be, something like uh, one, one and a third, four thirds or something. Like I, I kind of expected the answer to be ordinary um, for this function. After all, the area under the curve here is one third, which is very ordinary. The arc length here is, is a just a totally ridiculous uh, number. Uh, but let's, let's try it out, see what happens. All right, the arc length of y equals x squared. So my function is x squared, the derivative. This ought to be like a very easy example. It turns out not to be easy at all. This is uh, 2x, all right? So when I write my integral, it's going to be integral from 0 to 1, square root 1 plus f prime of x squared. That would be 2x squared, like so. And then I can square this out. One plus four x squared. Uh, actually, sorry, it's I, it's actually easier if I leave it that way because I'm going to do a u substitution. Um, so it's not a good idea to square this out. Um, what am I supposed to do with this? Actually, this one looks kind of like um, the trig substitution using tangent. Uh, x equals like 2 tan theta or maybe 1 half tan theta. Um, that turns out to be kind of a nightmare substitution. Even if you do that substitution here, um, you'll end up with a very weird integral after the fact. So at this point, I would suggest, and this I would say so in the assignment if this was like on the homework or something, look at a table of integrals I know at least one of you has such a thing on a piece of paper. Um, this is a weird integral to do. It's not something you do with an ordinary u substitution. Like I said, you could try to use a trig substitution with this one, but even so, it doesn't work out nicely. Even if you sort of do what you feel uh, is right, it doesn't work out nicely. If you look this up in a table of integrals, as I did, um, you will find an integral. So like in the back of, uh, of our textbook, at least in the back of the one that I have, it has tables, although I know some of you just have the electronic version. I don't know if, if they even have that. You will see an, uh, a formula for an integral that looks like this. 
This is a common integration formula. Anyone having to know this one? Is this one on your list? I don't know. This is an especially weird one, but here it is. It is u over 2 square root a squared plus u squared plus a squared over 2 ln u plus square root a squared plus u squared plus c. That is the formula which is necessary to find the arc length of a parabola, which to me is insane. This is like way more complicated than I would expect it to be, but uh, I, I am not overcomplicating this. This is how you have to do it. Do we All need right. to memorize this? No. <laughs> Certainly not. I can barely remember what cosecant is. Yeah. Um, this, so there may be some problems on the homework where I'll say you might have to use an integration table. Uh, and, and so I, I, I would expect to be able to do this on the homework, but certainly not on our, on our tests. By the way, our test is on Friday. Everybody knows that. OK, so let's see if we can work this out. Now, um, fairly, this is why actually I said in, because of what I'm about to do, it's not helpful to square this out. I actually want to leave that in there because I'm going to do a very simple u substitution to make it match this format exactly. I don't like this 2 right here. So just before I use that big formula, I'm going to do the substitution u equals 2x. Then inside the squared, it will just say 1 plus u squared. And that will match the, formula, the format that I want exactly. So that means du is 2 dx. So um, 1 half du is dx. All right, so my integration, and maybe just for fun, uh, I'll, I'll mix it up a little. Let's change the boundary values. Of course, you can plug it back in at the end if you like, although I know some people like to do it either way. Let's, let's do it this way around. Let's change the boundary. So when x is 0, u equals 2x, which is 0. And when x is 1, u equals 2x, which would be 2 times 1, which is 2. All right, so those are my boundary values. So it's going to look like integral 0 to 2 of square root 1 plus u squared times 1 half du. Sorry, I had to scroll that thing. All right, pull the 1 half out, and then we can use that ridiculous formula. And lucky for us, the a is just 1. So all the, all the a's over there are going to be 1's. All right, so this is... I pull the one half out of the integral, and now I'm going to write what you see in the big formula with a equal one. So it says u over two square root one plus u squared plus one half ln u plus square root one plus u squared. And I plug in zero and two. And this is whatever it is when you plug in 2 and 0. So it's 2 over 2 square root 1 plus 2 squared plus 1 half ln 2 plus root 1 plus 2 squared minus, when I plug in 0, the first part is going to be 0 because of this u over 2. And this part, I believe, is also 0. You get 0 here and then square root of 1 plus 0. So it's the natural log of the square root of 1. Natural log of 1 is 0. So that all of that other stuff is also zero. So really it's just this, this first thing is the answer. So when, you're, when your friends at, at, uh, at dinner ask you, what's, what's the uh, arc length along the parabola from zero to one? It's this number, which involves somehow like this is the square root of five and this is the natural log of two plus the square root of five. Very weird in my opinion. All right, any thoughts about that? So the moral of the story is, from my point of view, the arc length formula as a formula to write down in a box is a very simple formula. It turns out to be extremely complicated to use. And basically, with an ordinary function, you should not expect to be able to do the integral like at all. You, generally speaking, like a lot of the, if you look in our, in our textbook, a lot of the homework problems say things like, use Simpson's rule to estimate the integral because you end up with formulas that have no antiderivatives that you can write down in a sensible way. All right. So the arc length, I would say, is actually a hard thing to do mathematically. Um, and of course, in reality, basically impossible in most cases. Here ends what I want to say about the arc length. Any thoughts about that?
We got about 20 minutes remaining, and I think we can move on to the next bit. And actually, this is the end of uh, all of our talking about the integral. That's what like this, this whole semester, um, uh, about half, maybe a little more than half, is about the integral. And then the whole uh, rest of the class, we'll, we will not be talking about integrals anymore. So you can hang up your, hang up your coats. Um, what I want to talk about for the rest of the semester is sequences and series. I don't know if this is something that uh, you all have seen already in high school. I think these are likely to be new topics for, for more of you than the integral tricks. Sequences and series is what we're going to be talking about for the remainder of the semester. Uh, and what, uh, you know, for the next 20 minutes or so, it will be very basic stuff, which, which probably uh, everybody is familiar with. But um, just, to, just to get our kind of terminology straight. So let's talk about sequences for now, and then we'll talk about series, uh, you know, quite a bit later. So a sequence, when I say sequence, those two words, sequence and series, are not synonyms. A sequence is a list of numbers. Something like, you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. Or like 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. I hope you can see the pattern. The first one, those are even numbers. The second one, they are uh, powers of 2. Those are sequences. The word series is what, uh, what you call it when you try to add together all the terms. That's called a series. But um, when they're just numbers one after another, that is a sequence, all right? Or like everybody's favorite sequence, one, two, three, four, et cetera. Or everybody's second favorite, eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine. Anyone familiar with this one? There was a, there was a pop song in the 80s. The chorus was 8675309, which he says over and over again. Right? That one you might say is not a traditional mathematical sequence, but a sequence can be anything. It doesn't have to be like something which has a nice formula to it. It can be just any list of numbers. Now, a sequence does go on forever. It has to go on forever. So technically, like the, the song um, doesn't actually say this infinitely many times, but... Uh, you can turn it into a sequence if you want to. All right, so usually there are like mathematical formulas to generate these sequences. There's some kind of a pattern. And the way that our book writes those formulas is always gonna be like this, a n equals two n. Like that's what the first one is. Um, because if you want to get, say, the first one, you would look at, like, when I look in this formula with n equals 1, it's 2 times 1, which is 2. The next one would be 2 times 2, which is 4, and so on. What's, uh, can someone say the formula for this one? I don't know if this is a trick question. This is something like 2 to the power n. Now, it's a little, it's a little, uh, can someone say something, something's a little unsatisfying about the way that I wrote those two there? Anybody notice? Maybe not. Maybe everybody feels good about this. Um, I would say this in this one, it's like I started with n equals 1 is the first uh, number here. But this one, it's like the first number represents n equals 0. Because 2 to the power 0 is 1. I didn't write 2 times 0 here, which would be 0 to begin with. So the n's, it's typically uh, slightly ambiguous about the ends here, but I will just say usually n starts at 1 or 0, although uh, it's this notation as I wrote it up there is somewhat ambiguous um, as far as that goes. In our book, when they want to be very specific, so to be specific, um, if it was something like 2, 4, 6, 8, I could write this as, this is the way they write it in our book, 2n with these like curly brackets, and then they might write something like n equals 1 to infinity. So this is being very kind of explicit about, uh, I'm talking about 2n, which is the formula for the sequence, and specifically, I'm saying I should start with n equals 1 as the first number in the sequence and then 
uh, increase up to infinity. All right. All right. Great. Um, so this is basic terminology here. Um, some more terminology. Each individual number here, these numbers, the numbers are called the terms, the toims, the terms of the sequence. All right, so each number is a term. That's just the, uh, the terminology that we use to talk about the terms of the sequence. And um, it is going to be something we'll, we'll talk about every so often. It's just kind of like, if I show you a sequence, can you come up with a formula for that sequence? Um, or actually, the other way around is a lot easier. If I give you a formula, can you write down the terms? So this is a very simple type of basic question about sequences. Something like, uh, this is a formula for a sequence. I would like you to write the first five terms. This is very easy. It just means you plug in various values of n, the first five values for n. Uh, and should I start the n at 0 or 1? The answer is 1, because I said so right there. That's what this means. So writing the first five terms, I would sort of think about n equals 1 gives me minus 1 to the 1 times 1, which is negative 1. n equals 2 gives me minus 1 to the 2 times 2, which is positive 2, right? n equals 3 gives me minus 1 to the 3 times 3, which is minus 3, etc. n equals 4 will be a plus 4, and n equals 5 <laughs> will be a minus 5. All right. The effect of these minus 1 to the n, so this is a general pattern that you will, you will notice after a while, that when you see minus 1 to the n, this makes the signs alternate. If you see minus 1 to the n, it, the effect of that is just to make the signs flip-flop from one to the next. When n is odd, this will always be a minus sign, and when n is even, this will always be a plus sign. So if you ever want to make a sequence that has alternating signs, the way you accomplish that is by using a minus 1 to the n. All right? Great. Uh, in this case, yeah, that's fine, what I just said. This is very, very uh, simple stuff. There are some sequences that don't have an obvious ordinary formula. Here is a favorite uh, sequence of many people. How about um, this sequence here? Anybody familiar with this sequence? Anybody recognize these numbers? Yeah? Yeah, this is called the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence. I have a uh, I have a friend whose dad is really into the Fibonacci sequence, and I like I don't see his dad very often, but it's like every time I see him, he knows that I'm a math professor, and he was always like, "Hey, how about that Fibonacci, huh?" It's like that's that's what. That's what we talk about. His, this, this dad, so my friend's mom died recently, like a few weeks ago. And I went to the funeral and I saw the dad, um, but he didn't mention the Fibonacci sequence. <laughs> but then afterwards, which is fine, like his wife had just died. Um, but then afterwards, I was talking with my friend whose mom had died. And he's like, so did, uh, did you talk about the Fibonacci sequence with my dad? We didn't. Um, this is what can happen sometimes when people know you're a math professor. Um, the Fibonacci sequence, uh, each number comes from the sum of the previous two numbers. That's how these, I'm sure everybody has heard of this before. So like this 8, how do you know this is 8? It's because 8 is uh, 3 times 5. And then the next one is 5 plus 8, which is 13. So this one doesn't have a traditional formula for it in the way uh, like those other ones here, but this has a, this is what's called a recurrence formula or a recursive formula. And it is something like, um, there's a few ways to write this, but uh, you could write it like this. A0 is 1, A1 is 1, and then <coughs> An 
is a n minus 1 plus a n minus 2. Minus 2, I said. All right. So what that means is the Fibonacci sequence is defined so that the first two terms are 1s, and then all of the other terms are defined by this formula here, where each, each Fibonacci number is the sum of the previous two Fibonacci number. And the Fibonacci sequence allegedly appears in nature, although I think this is mostly uh, overhyped. Like, I personally am not all that. I think the Fibonacci sequence is kind of played out, in my <coughs> opinion. There's a lot of people, a lot of, uh, a lot of friends, dads are really into it. But um, I don't know. I, to me, there are, there are more interesting mathematical things. But the Fibonacci sequence is a, is a big favorite of, uh, of a lot of people. Um, anyone know who discovered the Fibonacci sequence? It's named after this guy, Fibonacci. But actually, that was not, the guy's name was Leonardo. Um, he lived in Pisa, like where the Leaning Tower is. And he was the son of Bonacus or something. And he was, somebody else wrote like the son of Bonacci. That's, that's the Fibonacci. Um, Fibonacci was uh, like he, his great, anyone know his great historical achievement? Fibonacci is actually like one of the most important um, people in the history of mathematics, at least uh, as we know it now. Um, he was the person uh, the main person responsible for bringing the Arabic number system to Europe. Like before Fibonacci, people were using like Roman numerals, which are just absolutely terrible. Like have you ever tried to do long division with Roman numerals? Like it, it doesn't work. You, you need to use the Arabic numbers to do any of those by hand calculations. And uh, Fibonacci brought them to, to Europe. Uh, anyway, something very interesting. Actually, there is a a more ordinary Fibonacci uh, formula for the Fibonacci sequence. This is something actually I think is very cool. To my knowledge, Tony's father is not aware of this formula, but there is a non-recursive formula. Maybe I should talk with him about this, but it's not the kind of thing that you can casually say like over a over a cup of hot chocolate or whatever. Check it out. This is, a, this is a true fact. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. You know this is crazy, even the way that I started. There's a formula for the Fibonacci numbers, which begins with 1 over root 5. But I will say the rest of it. 1 plus root 5 over 2 to the power n minus 1 minus root 5 over 2 to the power n. I'm not making this up. When you plug in values of n to this formula, it gives you the Fibonacci numbers. So like if you plug in n equals 5 over here to all of these weird exponents, um, these weird root 5s magically cancel out and you just get, I guess, 5, the, uh, the fifth Fibonacci number. This is, in my opinion, very, very strange and kind of beautiful that this that this works at all. But this is a formula for the Fibonacci numbers. And uh, interestingly enough, this, uh, this number here, 1 plus root 5 over 2, I don't know if you've seen that before. That is the, that's, the, um, that's the golden ratio, which is another thing that people like to talk about. Uh, so there's this weird formula for the Fibonacci's in terms of the golden ratio. Very strange. I got one more sort of fun sequence uh, that we can chat about, and then maybe that'll do us for today. Um, here is a cute sequence. Here's another one. Let's see if, uh, I, I think some people maybe have heard of this sequence. One, 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 two, one. This one, the sequence is better thought of just sort of the way that I was saying that rather than 21. It's easier to think of it sort of one digit at a time. Anybody uh, seen this before? The next term of the sequence is uh, 3, 1, 2, 2, 1, 1. Anybody seen this before? Anybody see the pattern, even if you haven't seen this before? This is, I said it's a cute sequence. It's very strange, but also surprisingly, like a lot of people have been interested in this sequence, even though it's, uh, it's fairly strange. And want to guess the next term? The next term is 1, 3, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 1. Eh? Now do you see the pattern? Probably not. This is referred to, the name of this, this is called the 
look and say sequence. Anybody get it now? Based on the name, the look and say sequence. For example, I will let, let, let's look at this one here. Let's look and say. What do, what do I see here? I see three ones, two twos, and one one. Right? That's what that is. Three ones, two twos, and one one. Eh? That's what you see right here. The look and say sequence. So you look at one of these, you say what it is, and that's what you write. So this one here, I see one, one at the beginning. So look sort of from left to right. There's one, one, so all right, one, one. One, three, one, three, two ones, three twos, and one, one at the end. That's the next term. Mm -hmm. This is called the look and say sequence. This may seem totally stupid to you, and the first time I ever saw this, I was like, yeah, all right, that's, that's cute and stupid. Actually, it's, this is surprisingly not stupid. Like, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of hardcore mathematicians have considered the look and say sequence, um, and there are a lot of very interesting properties of these numbers. One is, um, so far in the sequence, there's always ones, twos, and threes, but never a four. Anybody have a thought about that? Will there ever be a four? Or like maybe I just didn't write enough of them. Strange properties. One strange property is never any fours. Actually, there's never any digits other than ones and threes. Although it's not really clear why that should be true, but it, it, it's, it's not so hard actually if you think about reading the sequences um, sort of backwards. Like the way that these arose was like this. The reason this, this one is like that is because what I started with had one one and then one three and then two ones. So all the terms kind of come into these natural blocks of two. And if you, if you wanted to get a four in the next step, it means you would have to have four ones in a row in this step. But that can't be true based on the way the blocks work. It's not so hard to see. Uh, but anyway, this sequence never uses any fours or fives or six or whatever. This, the only digits which ever appear are one, two, and threes. Um, something else that's strange about this sequence is it always grows like each term is bigger than the previous one and that's not obvious but um, it it always uh, these these numbers always get bigger from one step to the next also this is not obvious and it's not necessarily true like for instance if you had something like well something like if you had started with 33 then the next term would be two threes, which is smaller. So it can happen in individual ones, but if you start with one and do this particular sequence, it never gets smaller. They always get bigger. Not, uh, again, not obvious, uh, but it, uh, true fact, this is always grows. And something else that's interesting, this is what I will, I will leave you with. If you take the ratios of each one to the previous, so if you take each term of the sequence and divide it by the one that it came from before, actually this limit exists. That is to say that these numbers, if you take the one divided by the previous one, they will, um, those, those fractions basically always give the same uh, amount. The next number, in the limit at least, always differs from the previous one by uh, a specific amount and this number is in in uh, in its digits, 1.303, etc. And this number is not a um, is not a well known number. Like it's not a multiple of pi or of e or anything like that. It's just some other weird number, which um, it can be proved. This is this is what I will leave you with. This number can't be expressed. using um, square or cube, etc. roots. 
but it can be expressed um, using roots of order 71. This is very strange, but um, you can express this number in a formula using roots of order 71, but not uh, any lower degree roots. So like the 71th root of something or other. Uh, there's some ridiculous formula for this number, which involves um, degree 71 polynomials and their roots. Very strange. Uh, check, you can read about this on the Wikipedia too if you're interested. Uh, we are going to talk about much less cute and more ordinary sequences when we get back to it tomorrow. There is homework due tomorrow, although it's only, um, only the one section about improper integrals. Let me know if you have questions.